This is a view from the bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. Giants in the Bible and a giant among Bible scholars. That's straight ahead on a view from the bunker. Prepare for spiritual war by arming yourself with information. Take advantage of these specials through March that dig deep into the Bible to help you make sense of the chaos around us. First, our Veneration Bundle, our two co-authored books, plus the travelogue DVDs from our Israel tours. An $85 value, just $45 plus shipping and handling. The Second Coming of Saturn Bundle, featuring my book and the 13-part companion DVD, a $50 value for just $35 plus shipping and handling. The This Is War special offer, featuring the Second Coming of Saturn, four DVDs, and seven hours of audio interviews with Bible scholar Dr. Michael Heiser, a $145 value for just $75 plus shipping and handling. And the Gilbert Fiction Collection, all eight novels in Sharon's Red Wing Saga series, plus my two novels, a $200 value for just $140 plus shipping and handling. These offers are available through March only at our online store, gilberthouse.org slash store. And again, we thank you for your prayers and support. Giants in the Bible were real, and yes, they matter even today. Welcome to A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. This is a subject that's fascinated me for years, and it's really led to the course of study that Sharon and I have pursued since, well, the last 20 years at least, and has resulted in the books Giants, Gods, and Dragons, Veneration, Second Coming of Saturn, and many others. And... um, The uh, gentleman we're bringing to you today has been foundational in our understanding of the Bible. This is an information, or rather an interview, I should say, that was recorded in July of 2021. Um, It was recorded to be released in four parts, which we did last March. The programs that um, the interviews were part of are no longer archived on the web, so I wanted to piece these together and present these to you because uh, they are foundational and because he has been so instrumental in really changing the course of our lives. And that's not, that's not overstating the case. Because his books, The Unseen Realm, Reversing Hermon, his reader's guides or companions to the Book of Enoch, and others, his willingness to share his research so freely with those of us lay Christians who are just interested in learning more about what uh, the Bible clearly tells us is the most important field of study that we can pursue in this life um, has just been remarkable. He has literally changed thousands of lives and helped many of us see the Bible as the exciting document that it is. And so uh, in an interview recorded about a month before he, he made public his diagnosis of pancreatic cancer, Dr. Michael Heiser. Yeah, thanks for having me. You said in some of your presentations that I've seen, uh, commenting on the Bible that if it's weird, if it's in the Bible and it's weird, it's important. Why? Well, I think a lot of those sorts of passages reflect, you know, an ancient worldview. And I think they're all good reminders of the fact that the people who God inspired, you know, to write scripture and produce it, they weren't us. I mean, they looked at the world a lot differently than we do. And so often these weird passages inform us of a different perspective and often it's a supernatural worldview as well and they remind us that you know hey if we're going to really interpret scripture well we can't filter it through you know the modern lens of our denomination or even you know who we are as western you know people you know post enlightenment you know modern people so I, I think the, the weird stuff not only gives us really profound information in many regards but they're just a healthy reminder of, of how we need to, you know, approach this thing we call the Bible in the right way. You know, we can talk about interpreting context all, you know, interpreting in context all we want. But that means a whole lot more than looking at the verses that are before and after the one you're looking at and remembering that they used pots, you know, back in the Bible days. And, you know, they rode camels. Okay, that's wonderful. But what we really need to do is get into their mindset, their worldview. And the strange passages force us to do that uh, if we want to handle Scripture well. 
One of the weirdest aspects of the Bible is, uh, well, pops up within the first six chapters of uh, Genesis, Genesis mm -hmm. 6, verses 1 through 4. It's been debated for literally thousands of years now, where the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were fair and took wives of any they chose. Giants. Did giants really exist, and why are they woven through the narrative of the Old Testament? Yeah, the short answer is yes, they did. Uh, at least if we assign, you know, passages like Genesis six and Numbers thirteen and Deuteronomy two and three, if we want to assign authority to what we read in the Bible, the answer is yes. Now you mentioned that that this this passage has been debated for a thousand, you know, a couple thousand years. Well, the funny thing is that it wasn't debated. Uh, in ancient Israel, or in the, the the period between the Testaments, what we call the Second Temple period, uh, before you know when the Old Testament ends, the New Testament begins, it's this is actually one of the few things that you can look at in that period. And there's multiple strains of Judaism, just like there are multiple strains of Christianity today, you know, Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestants about a hundred varieties. Uh, back then, this is one of the few subjects where everybody agreed. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was it, it was not a debatable thing. Uh, Peter, Second Peter, you know, in our New Testament is part of this period, the Second Temple period, and he very clearly, you know, links angels that sinned to the period of the flood and Noah. Uh, there is no other candidate other than Genesis six, and and that transgression of you know heaven and earth produced the Nephilim. And the Nephilim, again, you know, have, have other you know, descendants that go by different names. But, you know, if, if we're going to take this seriously, if we're going to take Scripture seriously, you know, we need to basically let the, the, the text speak to us. You know, and, and, you know, sometimes the text actually means what it says. <laughs> and again, this is one of those things. I think it's important because, you know, let's just isolate the answer to the, to the giants. <sighs> What, what is produced out of Genesis 6 is a lethal threat, you know, to the people of Israel. And I personally believe, and I talk about this in Unseen Realm a lot, that the rationale for the conquest, specifically the, the verbs of killing, you know, and extermination there, they are oriented around places where the descendants of the Nephilim were found and spotted and where they lived. So I think that the rationale of the conquest is driven by the need uh, the impulse to eliminate these descendants. And, you know, there's, there's lots of reasons why, but, you know, basically because this is one of the, the great rebellions of, of primeval days, according to the Bible, and it leads to the rise of demons. It leads to, you know, false teaching. Uh, Genesis 6, 1 through 4 leads to Genesis 6, 5. It, there's a thorough corruption of humanity. Uh, the, these things are all linked together. So it, it's important for those reasons. And what's really interesting is you get who eliminates the Nephilim. You get Moses, Joshua, and David. You know, the, the, the vestiges of the giant clans are wiped out during the time of David with Goliath and his brothers. And all three of those Old Testament figures are types. They're foreshadowings of the Messiah. And again, I don't think that is a coincidence at all because the Nephilim is one thing, but the, the other half, the other part of the Genesis 6 rebellion is, again, the demonic. And that's something that Jesus is going to take care of, you know, when, you know, he, he comes, you know, in his incarnation, does his ministry. He goes to these areas where, you know, the, the giants you know, formerly ran around in the Old Testament. And, and he does certain things, again, acts of spiritual warfare that tie into this. So it, it actually informs a number of, of passages, a number of episodes in both Testaments. So the war then against, the, to, the war of conquest to take Canaan was directed primarily at descendants of or those that were beholden to the giants. But also yeah. I want to I go back to the, the, the question of Jesus when we get done with this. So don't let me forget the demonic. You mentioned that. Uh, what's the link between the giants and the demonic? But first, let, let's address this. Joshua's war directed specifically at eliminating the remnant of the giants in Canaan? Yeah, and, and here's, here's why I say that. If you actually look up the, the verbs, you know, I'm, I'm a scholar, so we do things like look at verbs. Uh, if you actually look these up in the conquest account, there are verbs of killing for sure. There's you know three or four you know main you know words for that, but there are also other verbs like to dispossess, drive out. 
So it, it's not that everybody who lives there has to be exterminated. I mean, it, you, you could drive people out and, and it's still mission accomplished. But if you look at the verbs of killing and where in the conquest account those verbs are used, they are all in places where the Anakim or the Rephaim were spotted. And again, I don't think that's a coincidence. If The, the whole conquest actually begins with, with the giant stuff because on their way to Canaan to take the land, they, there's this episode in Numbers 13 where it launches the 40 years of, wil- of wilderness wandering. This is when the, the ten, uh, 10 spies say we can't you know, take the land and two, you know, Joshua and Caleb say we can. Well, what's the issue? the presence of the Anakim. And so their failure there launches their 40 years of wilderness wanderings. And then when they come back, God tells them specifically to go up the Transjordan. And and God tells Moses, look, don't worry about the Moabites. Don't worry about the Ammonites. Why? Because the children of Esau have already eliminated the giant clans there, the Amim, the Zamzumim, the Zuzim. He lists them out. And he he says to Moses, what I want you to do is go up to Bashan, why? Because that's the last of the Rephaim there. In the Transjordan, it's Og and you know, Sion. And so they do that. And then when they cross into the land, that's when you get the conquest that we think of occur. And again, the verbs of extermination and killing happen to be, what a coincidence, happen to be in the places where these you know, individuals are said to live. And at the end of the conquest, at least in Joshua's mind, in Joshua 11, he he defines the conquest this way. You know, here's victory in Joshua's definition. This is Joshua 11 around verse 22 or so. It says, there are no more Anakim in the land. Okay, two thumbs up. You know, yeah, like, yeah. There's no more Anakim in the land except the ones that got away to the Philistine cities. And look where we find them later. That's right. You know, 400 years Goliath later. Goliath and his brothers and, and David mops up the job. So the, the, uh, the whole discussion is oriented around getting rid of these chaos agents, okay? And I'm not talking about Maxwell Smart here. Uh, <laughs> what, I'm, what I'm talking about is it, the, the, the Nephilim and their descendants are viewed specifically as rival imagers, okay? The, the sons of God want to create their own, you know, populations, their own imagers, like, you know, God created his imagers, humanity, and back in Eden specifically to rival and oppose what God wants to do through his own people that emerge, you know, from, again, these Genesis 1 through 11 events, and that is Israel. So you have the vestiges of the forces of evil in the form of these Nephilim, at least at this time, and and they are a lethal threat to God's plan to occupy Canaan, very specifically. We, you know, if we had an hour here, we could talk about why Canaan and where the indigenous giant clans, where they come from. I mean, there are reasons for all this, but you know, we, this is very easy for us to read over. If if an ancient Israelite who was literate, you know, who like who knew his Bible, and you know, knew you know the, the sort of the historical circumstances, if they were listening to this interview, we'd probably have to wake them up right now, okay? Because <laughs> this would be just out of the gate, you know. We, we, we know this, like tell Theology us 101. New. Yeah. But again, we don't have that worldview. We're not, we're not tuned into the context. And, and that's why the weird stuff again is important. We, it forces you to think about how they looked at the world and, you know, ask yourself the question, am I really willing to interpret the Bible in its ancient context mm-hmm. or not? With just a couple of minutes left, you connected Jesus and the demons that he cast out to the giants of Genesis 6. Uh, Again, with just a couple of minutes, what's the link there? Yeah, all ancient Jewish traditions in the Second Temple period link demons to the Genesis 6 episode. Specifically, a demon was defined as the disembodied spirit of one of the dead giants, Ah. one of the dead giant clans. And everybody has that definition, again, in, in this period. And you say, well, that's, that's non-biblical. Well, you have to realize they're interpreting their Bible, okay, when they write this stuff. So where do they get it? There are a few passages that have, like Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 32, that have, you know, the, the Nephilim or the Rephaim in Sheol, in the underworld. So that you have disembodied dead, you know, giants. They're, they're, they were the demons. This is, how, this is where they get the idea. 
And so they seek re-embodiment. They're not like the sons of God that are imprisoned. Their, their spawn, as it were, the spiritual spawn, are free to roam around and they, you know, they, they seek to possess people. This is one of the reasons why they're called unclean spirits, by the way. And in, in my book, in my demons book, I have, a, I have a, a reference to a dissertation. It's now published on this. But demons are called unclean spirits because uncleanness in the Levitical Israelite worldview was about forbidden mixturing. And that's what they are. The Dead Sea Scrolls calls them bastard spirits because that's what they are. You know, Peter, why does Peter link false teaching, you know, to the angels that sin? Because, again, that's part of, you know, the, the, the tradition here with demons. So, there's a, again, there's a lot of things just going on underneath the text that are very easy for us to just read over because we don't have all this other stuff in our head. And that's what I try, you know, to, to get people to do, you know, when they study their Bible to try to, you know, get your mind back into the ancient world and, and just see what happens. Um, there's another interesting passage that we were privileged to hear you teach on at the Jordan River as part of our Skywatch TV Israel tour a few years ago, and that is the subject of baptism. Uh, Peter, who references this strange event in Genesis chapter 6, connects it uh, and the practice of baptism to the flood of Noah. What is the connection there, and, and why do we baptize? Yeah, the, the, the great blender passage, as I have come to refer to <laughs> Yeah, you know, Peter throwing in baptism and the ark, you know, Noah, the spirits in prison, the resurrection, like what in the world is this guy doing? Uh, to me, it's one of the one of the more interesting and really cooler passages in the New Testament. To really understand it, you have to you have to know something about typology. And and that's a that's a term scholars throw around, but it's actually a New Testament term. Paul uses it in Romans five when he says that Adam was a type to pass of Jesus. And what, what a type is, is an event or person or institution in Israelite culture that foreshadows something yet to come. And we know prophecy as, as verbal prediction. A type is sort of like a nonverbal prediction. It foreshadows something to come. And for Paul, Adam was a foreshadowing of Jesus in a variety of ways. And this is what Romans 5 deals with. Well, if we take that to 1 Peter 3, and we ask a simple question, hey, what if Peter, in writing all this weird stuff in 1 Peter 3, throwing it in the blender, what if Enoch is a type of Jesus for Peter, just like hmm. Adam was a type of Christ for Paul? And if, if, you, if you take it that way, the, the whole passage just falls into place. So here, here's what I mean. If you know the Enoch story, and we know Peter, because of the letters 1st and 2nd Peter, he dips into the Enochian literature in several places, and Jude for that matter. You know, these, these epistles are known for that. So he, he's aware of the material, and the story in the, in the book of Enoch about Genesis 6, you know, includes the, the watchers, the sons of God, and the, and the human women, and the Nephilim, the giants, the whole bit. But when God, you know, starts to judge them, you know, to clean up that situation, the watchers, again, the offending, you know, supernatural spirits say, you know, well, we don't really want to sit here in the abyss, you know, for, for eternity. That just stinks. You know, like, you know, can we get out of here? And so they, they ask Enoch, because Enoch's favorite, he walks with God, okay, just like Genesis says. They ask Enoch, could you go tell God that we're sorry, that we want to repent, and so on and so forth? And so Enoch takes this, this plea to God, and it's a pretty quick conversation. <laughs> God says, forget it. <laughs> You're not getting out here. And then here's the key phrase, but Enoch descends, and he gives this message to the spirits that are in prison. And the message is that, no, you're not going to get out. You still lose. You're defeated, so on and so forth. You know, God's punishing you, and then, you know, Enoch's, Enoch's gone. He leaves. Well, if you look at what Peter says, what if that Enochian story is a foreshadowing in Peter's mind of, of Jesus? Jesus dies. He goes to the realm of the dead, okay? And we, we know from, you know, the Bible just generally, but New Testament especially, that the afterlife, again, has these neighborhoods, we'll call them. And we were forced to use this language of geography for a placeless place, but we'll run with it. 
But while he's in the spiritual realm, he goes to the spirits in prison and they look at him and think, what are you doing here? Like, you're not supposed to be here. You know, you're the son of God. You're dead. You know, what? how'd that happen? And then it's like, oh, well, maybe, you know, maybe God lo loses. You know, may maybe, you know, our enemy, God, you know, failed or something like that. They think they, they've won something. Maybe we're going to get out of here. Maybe one of our buddies, you know, our buddy rebels, you know, is going to get us out of here. And so what does Jesus do? Again, if in the Enochian typology, he tells, he announces to them, yeah, you know, you're probably surprised, you know, that, that I'm here, but your doom is still secure because I know something you don't. <laughs> I'm not going to be here very long, and you are. <laughs> You know, and, and so when Jesus rises from the dead, he leaves the underworld. He leaves the realm of the dead. And they're still there. They're still under sentence. They're still under punishment. And so for Peter, Peter's looking at the resurrection as like, you know, th this whole thing fits the Enochian typology so that, so that what Jesus accomplishes is not only just sort of, you know, redemptive work for humans, but it's also a work that seals the doom of God's enemies, his cosmic enemies. And baptism for Peter commemorates this event. Now, we're already familiar with how baptism, you know, we're buried, you know, death, burial, resurrection, the Roman six imagery. If we, if we attach this stuff to it, look at what we get. We get baptism becoming sort of an act of spiritual warfare, that, that when, when I'm baptized, I'm announcing not only to the people who are watching me get baptized, but I'm also announcing and, and, and showing, demonstrating to the spirits in prison whose side I'm on. And I am not going to be a resident of the realm of the dead because I have everlasting life because I'm united to Christ through his resurrection. So in Peter's mind, all these things do go together because he's saying what he's saying through the lens of the Enochian story as a foreshadowing of what Jesus does and accomplishes. Now that is, that's quite foreign to the way we think. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I have never, you know, heard a, you know, a, a preacher or anything like that when, when they're talking about baptism, say anything like that. I've actually been in church where, where somebody just skipped first Peter three and told us he was doing it. It's too weird. I'm, I'm we're just skipping it. We're, we're moving on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm only seen that happen once, you know, thank the Lord, but I have seen it happen, you know, and it's like, this is one of the most powerful, theologically pregnant passages that there is in the New Testament, but we can't see it unless we're thinking in Peter mode. And that is, again, this Enochian typology. So, you know, the, the Enochian background is actually really important here. So when, when Peter writes that Jesus in the spirit went and and some translations will say preached to the spirits but others yeah. uh, indicate that the better word there is proclaimed yeah uh, in other words just went down there and declared this is how it is this is how it is dude. and the, the <laughs> and the, the spirits indicated there are not human spirits as many pastors have understood but the spirits of these rebels and this is why he connects it to the flood of noah isn't it yeah yeah and if people want more information i mean they they could go to unseen realm and i have you know scholarly literature there that will, will back this position. This is not a new position, you know, with, with me or, you know, really anybody. I mean, in, in ancient times, well, let's just go, let's just move it up a little bit. In church history, if you look at early baptismal formulas and baptismal creeds, they actually include a denunciation of the, of the devil and his angels in their baptismal ceremonies. Oh. And the reason they do it is 1 Peter 3. Like they actually have that element in there. Um, there there's, there's, a, there's a book that actually goes through this material. It's called The Devil at Baptism uh, by a, the author's last name is Kelly. So th this actually has gotten a lot of academic attention. But I, I have found let, that people default to, oh, these are, you know, the, the human spirits. There's nothing demonic here to see so it doesn't move along because, because that's sort of, that, that makes it easy to just sort of, move away from the passage and not sort of get into the guts of it. But if you think about it, it actually doesn't really have any message to it. Okay, dead people at the time of the flood, what does that have to do with the resurrection? You know, you know, it, it, the, the picture doesn't fit, but it's just an easy way to kind of escape the, 
you know, again, the, the strange, you know, the bizarre supernatural implications of what's going on. But do we assign authority to the Bible's view of the spiritual world? You know, there's a good question. You know, are we going to sit in judgment on what the Bible says about the supernatural world? You know, if we do that, I have a simple question. Well, why aren't you passing judgment on things like the Trinity and the Incarnation? How about the concept of salvation? Okay, all of these things are inherently supernatural. And so it's very inconsistent for us to affirm things that we like or that we feel we need, but then reject other things when newsflash, they come from the same source. So, again, this is a, you know, you know me long enough to know this is this is one of my one of my one string banjos here that if we're going to take scripture seriously for spiritual truth, OK, for supernatural worldview, for, for things that, that we can't put under a microscope, OK, anything to do with the spiritual world, then we need to be consistent about it. Otherwise, we are fashioning our theology to suit ourselves and to make us comfortable. And that really isn't why the Bible was given to us. Uh, Mike, for people not familiar with Mount Hermon, what is it and why is it important to understanding Christian theology? Yeah, Mount Hermon is the place where in Enochian literature and, and other Second Temple Jewish literature that the watchers, the biblical term for them would be the sons of God of Genesis 6, descend from heaven and, you know, launch into their their transgression of the boundaries between heaven and earth and decide to corrupt humanity. So it 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 was one of those places that, that became kind of ground zero for supernatural evil. I mean, its own location is in the region in the Old Testament that used to be known as Bashan, which in Canaanite was known as Bathan, which means serpent. You know, this region had a couple gateways to the netherworld, according to Canaanite Ugaritic texts. This is not where you want to go on vacation. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it just had a sinister, a supernaturally sinister reputation. And the reason why it's important, you know, in the Old Testament, we have like Psalm 68, where where the psalmist is is speaking to Mount Bashan, you know, the, 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 the mountain of God or, the, the you know, the mountain of wannabe. And, you know, it, you know, he says, he says, why are you so jealous of the mountain that God has chosen for his own, you know, which is Sinai. So there's this rivalry between Hermon and Sinai. And if you keep reading in Psalm 68, this is the mountain where the psalmist said that God is going to conquer this place and, you know, put, bring the captives in his train and, and you know, bring them back you know, from the sea, which is a, a, a chaos lingo. And it's the passage Paul quotes in Ephesians 4, the old captivity captive, you know, passage, that that part of what Christ accomplishes is to defeat, again, cosmic evil forces. And, you know, if he's quoting Psalm 68, he has Bashan in view. And so he's he's nullified their authority. He's taken them captive. He is Lord over them. He is going to, you know, be be the God is going to be the Lord of this place, you know, this this place of darkness. It's a conquest, you know, statement in Ephesians four that is is very, you know, easily linkable to what we th we think of in a bigger picture as spiritual warfare. I mean, Jesus goes to this region. We we have the gates of hell passage in Bashan, and then six days later they go up into a very high mountain. Well, there's only one there. That would be Mount Hermon. And what happens there? It's the transfiguration. So why does Jesus pick this region and this place, this mountain, to do this stuff? You know, in, in, you know my view, as I've, I've, I'm known for in Unseen Realm, is he's, he's going there to pick a fight. He's going there to provoke. You know, he goes to Caesarea Philippi, again, right there at the foot of Hermon. And this is where, you know, we get the thou art, you know, you're, you're, you're Peter and you're, you know, I'm going to I'm going to build my church on this rock and the gates of hell will not be able to withstand it. This is this is where he does, it, you know, right in, in view of, of this place. And it, it's a it's a threat. It's a it's a smackdown. I mean, Jesus goes there and he is really trying to provoke the enemy. 
because he knows the clock is ticking. I mean, it, it, we're not that far removed when he does this from his own, you know, crucifixion. Um, so it, it's a it's a spiritual warfare place, both in terms of darkness and also in terms of Jesus challenging it and defeating it, because he defeats the Lord of the underworld. Okay, I, I'm going to build my church. Essentially, I'm I'm going to turn you know the gates of hell. Okay into you know satan's tomb in, in effect and he goes to again to hermon to be transfigured and he reveals who he is as if to say well here i am like do something about it you know <laughs> so it's it's he does these provocative things and as and as soon as he's done with them the, the the gospels say from this time forth you know jesus began to teach his disciples that he needed to go to jerusalem and die you know, and they get freaked out. But, but like, that's the plan. So he needs to get the ball rolling here. It is time to enact, you know, God's plan. The, the, so he goes and picks a fight. They go to Jerusalem. They have the triumphal entry. And a week later, he's dead. And, and, it, and there as, we go. As, as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 2, uh, verses 6 through 8, that yep. if the archons or the rulers of the age had understood what was going on, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, as we said in the previous segment, when Jesus in the spirit descended into uh, the, the abyss and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, is it possible that uh, they thought because they realized, okay, he is the son of God and he's fully human now, He's vulnerable. He's vulnerable. Maybe they, did they think that they could get away with actually, as in the parable? I do. The, I, I, the I, re, the, I do think Satan and and you know other forces. They they thought this was the solution to the dilemma. You know, I don't have this in unseen realm, but I think I think Jesus' temptation scene is, is really important for this because when he's when he's propelled by the Holy Spirit to go out into the wilderness, which of course is the the domain of chaos in the Old Testament. And he he has this conversation with Satan. You know, we're familiar with, you know, Satan tries, you know, three tests or three temptations, and Jesus responds with Deuteronomy. And, you know, we get all that. But what we kind of miss is, is one of those tests, Satan whips out Psalm 91 to Jesus. And Psalm 91, again, this is something we wouldn't ordinarily know, but was that psalm was viewed as an exorcistic psalm by Jews of Jesus' day in, in that intertestamental period. We know that because at Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, Psalm 91 was in the same jar with four other exorcistic psalms that are not in the Bible. And in the, in the Septuagint, different versions of the, of the text, it's a psalm of David. And th this is where you know, we get this, this notion that in the intertestamental period that David and Solomon could cast out demons. This is why. Uh, because Psalm 91, if, you know, if you're reading it in Hebrew, there are four or five terms there that are names of Canaanite deities. In other words, there are these demonic you know, forces. Right. And so one of the verses of this psalm, Satan using an exorcistic psalm to test Jesus. I mean, think about that. It says, well, <laughs> you know, Satan says, okay, you know, you're, you're the son of God, right? Yeah, I get it. Um, doesn't the scripture say, you know, that you know, God will protect you. So why don't you just throw yourself off here, the pinnacle, you know, of the temple or this mountain. And, you know, if you're the son of God, you should be okay. Now, what? why is he doing it? Well, let, let's say that, that Jesus says, yeah, I am the son of God, so watch. You know, like <laughs> he hurls himself. If, this, if the psalm is, is accurate, you know, lest the angels will bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. What has Satan learned? Well, I guess mm. we can't kill him. Yeah, yeah. Oh, hmm. I so I I think he's fishing for information. Never considered so, that. Very and, interesting. And, and, and Jesus cannot put this card on the table because that's exactly what has to happen. He must die. So if he succumbs to this trick, this fishing expedition on Satan's part. Satan has just learned a valuable thing. In fact, he's learned the thing that would be the most damaging to the whole program working. And basically, Jesus tells him to take a walk, you know, on a short period. Uh -huh. <laughs> like, like, thou shalt not put the Lord your God to the test. You know, it, it, he just cuts the conversation right there. Like, you're not, you're not gaining any information here. Sorry, 
Mm. You know, I'm not falling for this. Fascinating. Now, the, the, the importance of Mount Hermon in the Anakic literature as the site of the Watchers' Rebellion, uh, we're familiar with that from the Jewish perspective. What did the pagans around uh, ancient Israel, uh, uh, absent Bashan, we know that the land, the lowlands uh, at the foot of Mount Hermon were considered an evil place, but what was the significance of Hermon to the, the Canaanites and the Amorites? Yeah, I mean, th this, was, this was considered the, the mountain of the gods, the the home base of, of the council of the gods in, in, you know, back at Sumerian and Mesopotamian, you know, religion. So this was the seat of their authority, you know, the seat of the gods. So it, it, it's no surprise that it would continue to be perceived as again, you know, kind of the vortex, if you will, uh, of, of chaos forces. I mean, this is their, this is their headquarters, you know? And so, you know, it, that it's something that never really goes away. I mean, even later, when you get into Roman times, you've got, of course, the the uh, the seat of Pan there. You know, the cave of Pan. You've got you know altars to Zeus at different times. You know, and Zeus, of course, claims to be most high. You know, in, in Greco-Roman authority. So you you've got this attachment to this place, not only the reason, but region, but specifically the mountain of of Hermon in a number of, of ancient pagan religions that really, again, considers it their, their chief base of operations. It's fascinating that uh, in 1869, Sir Charles Warren discovered a stela in, the, yeah. in a temple on the summit that uh, was written in Greek, dedicated to the, uh, the, the, those who swore an oath a reference to the the watchers of uh yep. of sounds familiar it does <laughs> yeah you know it, it it shows that you know well into the hellenistic period people are aware of, of what the place is they they're aware of of the, the stories and the traditions and you know how this ties in with with biblical stuff but I, I, I'm hoping that people listen to this one of the things they really take away is the fact that we don't know this stuff <laughs> You know, again, to, to somebody in the ancient world, you know, if, if you just said, hey, let, let's let's go up to Bashan for some R&R, &R, you know, this weekend, <laughs> they're going to look at you like you're insane. You know, <laughs> no, it, it's it's a spooky place. You know, it, it's foreboding. It's evil. Uh, again, they're, they're going to be used to these ideas. And then when things happen there, especially when, when it's Jesus or some other you know spiritual figure. This is going to spell spiritual warfare to them. But it, it, these things are basically meaningless to us unless, you know, we take the time to get into their world you know, and have that fixed in our minds when we read Scripture. The work that first attracted Sharon and me to you back in, I think, 2005 was your work on something called the Divine Council. What is the Divine Council? Yeah, the Divine Council in simplest terms is the heavenly host you know we can we can say the heavenly host that are loyal to god i think that that's an important qualification there but it's still imprecise you know because the divine council has hierarchy and you know levels just like congress would okay uh you, you'll see that the phrase academically in academic writing you know, divine council, divine assembly, but it, it's really the heavenly host, those those beings that are in the service of God in some way. And some of those beings he allows to participate in decisions. You actually see meetings in scripture of God with his heavenly host, and, and they're called a council to make certain decisions. Um, biblically, I think the clearest passage to this is Psalm 82, uh, because you, you, you get very explicit language there. And as I relate in Unseen Realm, this was sort of a watershed passage for me. The first time I was challenged to read this in Hebrew, Psalm 82, 1 says, Elohim nitzav ba'adat el. So Elohim, very familiar term for God. Nitzav is a singular verbal. It's a participle. So one God, capital G-O-D, stands or takes his stand in the adat el, the council of el or the council of God or the divine council. And then the next line is, the care of Elohim Yishpot. Notice the word Elohim occurs again. It says, in the midst of the Elohim, he, the first one, passes judgment. So you look at Psalm 82, 
and you have a very clear reference to a council that God is presiding over, and that council is made up of other Elohim, other gods. Sounds like a pantheon. You get down to verse 6, and they're mentioned again. When the, the first, again, God is speaking, he said, I said to all of you, you are all Elohim. Okay, there it is again. Sons of the Most High, B'nai Elion, but you're going to die like mortals. That's not good <laughs> if you're one of those guys. No. Verses 2 through 5 he explains why God is angry at them. So this is not the Trinity. Okay, these multiple Elohim, this is not the Trinity because God isn't saying to the Trinity, the other members of the Trinity, you guys are corrupt and you're going to die like mortals. You know? It, it, you know, the, so the Trinity is not even on the radar here. And so this is the one of the major passages. Psalm 89 is another one, has the same council language, the same sons of God, sons of the Most High. There is only one Most High, so it's sons of God in Psalm 82, Psalm 89. And the council is in the skies, you know, it's in the heavenly realms, okay? So we're not talking about people. Okay, this, the gods aren't men here, even though lots of commentators will say that, Yeah, which is absurd when you think about it for all sorts of reasons. We're also not talking about idols. Okay, idols are not on God's payroll. Okay, God doesn't meet with idols. Idols aren't going to get sentenced to die because they're just blocks of wood and stone. Okay, what's behind the idol or what was thought to live in the idol when you opened its mouth or performed some other ritual act to animate the idol, you, you believed as a pagan that some real deity, real entity, came and lived inside that object or attached itself to it. So we're not talking about pieces of wood and stone. We're not talking about people. We're talking about supernatural beings that are being judged by God in a council, in a council meeting. And there, there are four or five, you know, pretty clear, you know, divine council meetings uh, in Scripture. There's, you know, First Kings 22, 19 through 23. There's Daniel 4. Where, where one of the watchers uh, goes to Nebuchadnezzar and says, hey, king, you know, because you're an arrogant jerk, you're going to go insane for a while. <laughs> Just thought you'd want to know. Well, and what's but really, interesting, actually, what's really yeah. interesting about that passage is that that actually says this punishment is by decree yeah. of the watchers. Yeah, it says this, this, this judgment is the, by the decree of the watchers, by by the you know the the verdict is by you know decision of the holy ones they're in its plural and you get down to verse 25 it, the the language is repeated where it's the verdict is you know decreed but handed down by the most high so it's important that we realize the council isn't like some rogue entity okay that it's god and his council but there's still a council and, and the watcher says hey we we decided you're an idiot <laughs> so you need to be taught a lesson uh, you got Daniel 7, which is a classic divine council passage. Ancient of days is seated. You know, the, the Son of Man, the one coming on the clouds is there, and he receives the kingdom. But, but it says the court sat. Okay, the council sits, again, to render judgment. And specifically, they're meeting about what's going to go on with the four beasts, you know, in, in the first part of Daniel 7. And, and basically, they're going to be toast, and the Son of Man is going to inherit the kingdom, the eternal kingdom, where in Daniel 2, it's the kingdom made without hands, which is the kingdom of God. So we know who the Son of Man is. That, that's not rocket science. You know, but, but again, you have a meeting. God allows his, these lesser entities to participate. Now, I have found that people get freaked out by the Elohim language. Okay? And, and we, the reason why we do is because this is the way we're taught as Westerners and as Christians. We're taught that when you see the letters G, O, and D on a screen or on a piece of paper, Oh, my brain's telling me that G-O-D means a specific set of unique attributes, like omniscience, omnipresence, eternality, okay? It doesn't. You know, that, that's not the way that a biblical writer thought about Elohim. And you don't have to take my word for it, okay? What you do is you look up, you know, and it, it would take you a while unless you have software. It's, it's 2,000 plus times. But the biblical writers will use Elohim of things that are not the God of Israel. That alone tells you it's not about attributes. Because if it was about attributes, they'd only use the word Elohim for one of those. Okay, they'd only use it for Yahweh, but they don't. They use it for you know, members of the council, Psalm 82.1. You have the gods of the foreign nations, like in 1 Kings 11.33, you got a few gods listed there, and they're called Elohim. 
You've got the Shadim, which your English translations will have as demons mm -hmm. in Deuteronomy 32, 17. These are, the, again, the, these territorial entities put over part, you know, geographical nations or regions that Israel commits idolatry with. You know, Paul quotes Deuteronomy 32, 17 in 1 Corinthians 10, 21, 22, to warn believers to not have fellowship with demons. I mean, Paul obviously believes demons are real, and he quotes Deuteronomy 32, 17 as his proof text for don't go, you know, eat the meat that is part of these temple rituals. You know, don't participate in this because you can't be a partaker of the table of demons and the partaker of the table with the Lord. You know, you you have all these things in 1 Samuel 28, 13, the departed deceased dead are called Elohim. Mm -hmm. Again, no Israelite in his right mind is going to think my dead aunt or uncle has the same attributes as the God of Israel. Like they're ontologically equal. Well, they're both called Elohim, Mike. Well, yeah, they are. But this ought to tell you that the term's not about attributes. All, all it is, it's like it's a term like spirits. Mm -hmm. We're cooked. You would use the word Elohim to describe an entity in the spiritual world who is by nature disembodied. That's all it is. So in, in biblical theology, yeah, there are lots of gods, okay? There are lots of Elohim. All they are is spirit beings, okay, in the spirit world. The spirit world's an anim, a populated place. But only one of those Elohim are Yahweh, hmm. period. End of story. And, but that theology doesn't come from the word. It comes from the fact that this one, Yahweh, is described in very specific ways like omnipotent, omniscient, eternal. And those attributes are denied to all other Elohim. So our theology that we have is, is good theology, but it doesn't come from the term Elohim. So we don't need to be afraid when we hit Psalm 82 and see lots of Elohim. They're all, oh, I have to be a polytheist now. <laughs> no, no. Okay, let, I mean, let's try to think a little more clearly than this. But that impulse is why you get so many commentators that just say, well, the gods here are men. Mm -hmm. Trying By to the avoid way, if you're out there listening, the yeah, go up. I, I didn't hear what you just said. Uh, just, just trying to avoid having to deal with a, uh, a uh, theologically complex situation. It's just easier yeah. to avoid it altogether and dumb it down. Yeah, you know, we on my podcast, I get the question so many times because Jesus quotes Psalm eighty two six in John ten thirty four, and if you believe the gods are just men in Psalm eighty two, why would Jesus quote this psalm to defend his deity? You know, because back in verse thirty, he says, "I and my Father are one," and they're not. I mean, the Jews who are listening to that aren't thinking, "Well, I agree with God too. We have the same thoughts, and I I have the same, you know, predilections and goals that God does." It's not this meeting of the minds thing. They pick up stones to stone him. They're not going to stone him for, for being in agreement with God because they're going to think they're in agreement with God too. Rather, he quotes the passage to say, hey, dudes, you know, your your own scripture says that, that a phrase like son of God can sometimes mean more than a man, doesn't it? Psalm 82. Mm -hmm. and, and then he goes on to say, not only am I and the Father one, but two verses later after he quotes Psalm 82, he says, the Father is in me and I'm in the Father. I'm actually the Lord of the council. So, you know, like, do something with that. And, you know, and, and they get just as mad at the end. So, you know, again, I, I have yet to find a New Testament scholarly commentary by an evangelical who will affirm in John chapter 10, what I just described to you, all of them that I've ever run into, if you, if you find one, send it to me. I'd, I'd love to see it. But all of them will say the gods in Psalm 82 are just men. And so Jesus is saying, look, your own scripture says that, that you know, I can call myself a son of God because you're sons of God, too. We're all sons of God. We're all one happy family here. You know, that, would, that has Jesus backing off verse 30. And, you know, I got news for you. That's not the way the Jews are reading it. And no. Jesus does not back off. Well, uh, he gives it to them both barrels. Now, you've written an academic paper on that. Is that available? Yeah. If people go to the, the nakedbiblepodcast.com, and it's, it's actually episode 109, 
So if you if you Google that, nakedbiblepodcast.com, Jesus, Psalm 82, or something like that, or go to the to the podcast site and look for uh, episode 109. On that page, you not only get the podcast episode, you'll get me narrating a slide presentation about John 10 and the paper you just alluded to. Mm. It was a yeah, it was an academic paper I read at a regional society of biblical literature meeting uh, mm. a few years ago. So that's there too. So the bottom line: Psalm 82, courtroom scene in heaven. God passes judgment on rebellious entities who have not been administering his creation earth justly and the sentence is literally the death of the small g gods yep and since at the end of the psalm when the psalmist you know says he the psalmist ends by this proclamation this plea this you know plaintive you know begging god to rise up and take the nations and judge judge the nations you know that's linked to what we call the deuteronomy 32 worldview which is again the, the Gentile nations who are in opposition to Israel. And that's linked in by Paul in Romans 11. The fullness of the Gentiles is linked to the reawakening of Israel. This is all eschatological in judgment. So when, when the Great Commission is accomplished and Israel has its reawakening, then the Lord will return and the end will come and the gods will be destroyed. I mean, all these things go together. But, but again, you you you, you sort of eviscerate that little ball of theology of half of its ingredients if you're denying what Psalm 82 actually says. Hmm. Fascinating stuff. It makes the Old Testament uh, a lot easier to understand. It makes reading the Bible a lot more interesting and exciting. Uh, Dr. Michael Heiser, author of The Unseen Realm, Reversing Hermon, many other books, uh, his website, drmsh.com. Mike, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule for us. Yeah, absolutely. You'll find a link to Mike's website in the show notes at vftb.net or wherever else you are watching or listening to this podcast. I'll also put a link to uh, Meal Train, which is a way you can help uh, the Heiser family during this um, period of time. I mean, it's uh, preparing meals is not something you want to have to think about when uh, your your family is uh, going through this trial. And so uh, this is a way that you can be of support to uh, to Mike and Drina Heiser. I'll also put a link to Mike's nonprofit ministry, Miklot, which helps to take Mike's work, translate it into other languages, and share it around the world. Those are ways that you can be of uh, help right now. Uh, again, it is difficult to overstate the um, the impact that Mike has had on our lives, and one of the great honors that Sharon and I have had in our lives to be able to stand on the on the slopes of Mount Hermon during our tour of Israel back in 2018 with Mike and watch and listen as Mike was able to teach our group that uh, had gone with us to Israel on that uh, Israel tour. So uh, again, continue to pray for Mike, for Drina and their family. And again, follow the links in the notes as a way to be of help to the Heiser family at this, uh, at this difficult time. Mike's, um, well, I've talked about this in a previous program. Um, Mike knows where he's going. We know we will see him again someday. And so our our sense of loss is uh, is for this life only. But as Paul wrote, if our hope is in this life only, we are of all most miserable and most to be pitied. So um, I'm paraphrasing, of course, and butchering his, uh, his words, but uh, you get the sense of the idea. We are playing a long game, and that is what the unseen realm is all about. There are evil intelligences who want to distract us and destroy us. And our Lord and Savior has been very patient with us in granting us free will to make the decision to follow him and uh, to be a part of uh, his kingdom when he establishes it here on earth. We have an exciting uh, tour coming up this fall to other gentlemen who will gladly say how influential Mike has been in their lives. Dr. Aaron Judkins and Dr. Judd Burton, they will be joining us on our tour of Turkey. Uh, We're trying to be polite. The uh, the Turkish government has um, said, you know, this is how, what we call our country in our country. So we'd appreciate it if you called it that. Happy to do it. So uh, we are going to Turkey, October 18th through November 3rd. 
And the itinerary that we have lined up is um, phenomenal. Judd and Aaron have been working on a, uh, a collaboration research into Gobekli Tepe and the influence of the unseen realm on Gobekli Tepe. There are other sites in that region, like Karahan Tepe, that may be even older, that uh, likewise show that kind of influence. And we will be visiting Gobekli Tepe, Karahan Tepe, not open for tourists yet, but um, having Aaron and Judd there to share their research on location is a once in a lifetime. A once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. We will also be visiting the Churches of Revelation, the sites of the Churches of Revelation, which makes sense because Sharon and I do produce the weekly program Unraveling Revelation. So we'll be going there. And at Pergamum, uh, outside Pergamum is the uh, uh, the site of Heropolis, which featured the Plutonion, named for the god of the dead, Pluto, Hades. And uh There is a cave that belches out carbon dioxide in such concentration that the sacrificial animals were just walked up to the mouth of the cave where they keeled over. The CO2 is heavier than air, so your little goat or lamb would be at a height where they suffocated. Now, it's cruel, but that's what they did back in the day. But we will visit the Plutonion and discuss the gates of hell, which is the topic of our forthcoming book, which we pray will be out this fall. So that, among other sites on the tour, Mount Nemrut and the massive idols that have been uh, that were erected there back in the third century BC, some fascinating uh, locations, Abraham's hometown of Haran and uh, San Liurfa, which may be Ur of the Chaldees. Uh, if you've watched or listened to this program, read any of my books, you know that I am convinced that Abraham did not come from ancient Sumer. Nobody thought that until a hundred years ago when uh, Sir Leonard Woolley found the site of Ur in what is now southeastern Iraq, all the evidence in the Bible, uh, the location of Abraham's relatives, the fact that there were other cities around ancient Haran that share the same name as some of Abraham's relatives, they point to him coming from that region up in the north. That's why we're going there, among other reasons. It's a once-in-a-lifetime tour, but you got more information at our website, gilberthouse.org slash travel. And uh, the Turks, uh, as we have been told, are welcoming... And hoping for more tourists, they had a record year in 2022, despite the political instability between Russia and Ukraine on the opposite side of the Black Sea. In fact, we are told that Ukrainians fleeing Ukraine are coming to Turkey and settling there because it's safe. So uh, don't be concerned about uh, security. That apparently is not uh, a problem. We are looking forward to this and, uh, again, shooting video and uh, if you can't come with us uh, or just the timing's not convenient we will have video to show you what we we see while we're there and of course many interviews with Aaron and Judd while we're on location this is going to be jaw dropping uh, again more information gilberthouse.org/travel appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to listen or watch um we are in the process this year 2023 of trying to move our offices from our bedroom this was formerly a guest bedroom As I mentioned in a previous program, our podcast studio for our weekly Bible study is in the room behind me. Our shipping office for our books and DVDs is in the bedroom across the hall from me. And our Unraveling Revelation studio is now our family room. And I do the 5 and 10 news analysis for Skywatch TV in a sitting room off of our master bedroom. We've got a 1,200 square foot shop building, but it needs insulation. It needs HVAC needs uh, improved windows because it's got a couple of windows in it that right now are just storms letting you know air in and out uh so it's not a huge amount of money but we don't want to have to go into debt to finance it so if you are so led to help us build barn better in 2023 we do have a link at the website vftb.net or gilberthouse.org you'll find a big red button in the right hand column there and uh, we do appreciate your prayers and your support your prayers of course most of all a view from the bunker is a production of gilbert house ministries released under creative commons attribution and commercial no derivatives 4.0 international license special thanks to our announcer dc good and we do this because we wrestle not against flesh and blood i'm Derek gilbert and this is a view from the bunker <laughs>